Okay, good morning, everyone. So I think this is where we left off yesterday. So I was telling you about uh, the Damures positive Farese uh, model, which is this action here, and how, how it can have, for compact stars, both GR solutions and non-GR solutions, but if the star is not sufficiently compact, then the GR solution is preferable, and if the, um, if the star becomes sufficiently compact, then, then the scalar field develops at a hionic instability, it tends to grow, this instability is quenched by non-linearities, uh, and then a scalarized, as, as we call it, configuration appears, so a non-trivial configuration for the scalar inside and outside the star, and hence the space-time is not any more than space-time of GR, and this happens sharply at the given compactness or central density, and, and, um, and hence it looks like, like a phase transition. And then I went on to tell you that, of course, the problem is that, I mean, th this is good, but it is heavily constrained. So, so, so I started all of this talking about the binary pulsars, and indeed this was the research that motivated people to give up kind of the prejudice that, okay, we've already constrained deviations from GR with, from, with gravity and go and look at the binary pulsars uh, and, and obtain constraints. And indeed, this model is basically uh, ruled out by the data by just looking at binary parts as the simplest version, at least, of it. You could, you could add a mass and make the scalar massive, which would then confine the scalar, and then that would kind of... Um, so if you were to confine the scalar, so if you had two pulses, which are dressed with a scalar configuration, but the fall-off is not one over R, but instead it's exponential because of the mass, then the two scalar fields in the two stars don't really interact, so there is no scalar emission, and hence you could ev evade the constraints. So you just created a model with not much phenomenology, okay? Um, so, so the question is, can we, can we do the, the same for black holes, right? And so here is the action, here's an action very similar to the one I showed you yesterday. So it's the Einstein-Hilbert term, a canonical kinetic term. So yesterday I was considering an action where here I had some Campli constant times phi times the gauss monet invariant. Now I'm allowing this to be a general function of phi. And I've written here the corresponding equation uh, for phi, where prime is the dif differentiation with respect to the argument. Uh, so if you just inspect this equation, you can see that the only re way for this equation to admit phi equals constant solutions, which I call phi zero, is if this condition here holds. Right? So if this condition holds, then, then uh, constant phi configurations are admissible. Then if you go and look at the generalized Einstein's equations, which I haven't written down, then you will see that this leads to, to uh, all of the terms containing phi vanishing. And, and hence, you just go back to general relativity and you get the solutions of general relativity. So, so this condition here is, a condi is a kind of a, an, a, an a, an existence condition for the GR solutions in this theory, right? But as before, that doesn't mean that they are the preferred solutions for a given configuration, right? Then you can take this theory, and you saw it, I think, yesterday in your tutorial. You can take this theory and prove an her theorem for it, um, subject to this condition here. So, so you can show that if, provided that, that this holds, that the phi equal constant solutions are admissible. So obviously this doesn't hold if f is linear, right? Because if the derivative then is a constant, so if it's not zero, you, and that's why you always had hairy black holes in the previous case. But say, say f is quadratic, is phi square, then the derivative is phi, phi equals zero would be a constant solution. So this is the kind of the case, I'm, this is the simplest case I'm talking about. So if this holds, if you're in this, class of theories, then you can show that this solution, the constant one, is unique, right, by proving an Oher theorem for this, which is subject to this condition, and this condition is very similar to the one I showed in a previous Oher theorem, because you can interpret this as the mass square of the scalar perturbation being positive, right? So, um, 
So, but what happens if it's negative? Well, if it's negative, you can already see that this becomes a tachyonic instability. You will have the scalar equation, where the scalar perturbation, if you go kind of in the vicinity of the point, uh, this, as I said, would become the effective mass square. If you make it negative, then the scalar field will want to grow exactly in the, like the Damour's post of Areza model, right? So this is, so there are classes of theories where you could create this tachyonic instability for black holes, and now it is controlled. Look, I mean, if you look at this, of course, there is phi double prime here. So for instance, if this was phi, phi squared, sorry, it's F double prime here. If this was phi squared, say, here, you would have just a coupling constant, right? And everything would be controlled by, by curly G. If you have a more complicated function, the value of phi will be important as well, okay? So you have an effective mass square controlled by curvature now. And what you can do is you can say, okay, so GR solutions are admissible. I want to find when they're subject to this tachyonic instability. So I go and look at the value of the gauss bonnet invariant for care. I've written it here. Chi is, is the usual spin parameter uh, times cos theta, right? So, so, uh, so for Schwarzschild, chi, chi is zero. And, and then just by inspection, you can see that, <coughs> that G is manifestly positive in the exterior of the Schwarzschild space-time, right? So if you want to go back to that condition that I had, you get scalarization when this condition holds. So it's just a matter, so, so, so for instance, for the phi square coupling, that would be just a matter of choosing the sign of your coupling constant, right? Right? I mean, I'm, I'm not being completely uh, truthful to you here. So this is, this is a necessary, not a sufficient condition for getting scalarization. So, so for phi square, it would just be a question of choosing the coupling right for, for more general functions. You'd have to satisfy this condition. And I'm saying it's a sufficient and a necessary condition because remember what I told you yesterday, this is curved space time. You just, just don't just need a negative mass squared. You need to be sufficiently negative. So you also need to crank up the value of, of G enough to, to make the, effect, the negative effective mass have a larger module, right? So, so what would happen? So, but I mean, this is controlled for, for Schwarzschild. This is controlled only by the mass of the black hole, which means if you may, so it's the mass of the black hole and G is manifestly positive and grows towards the horizon. So it will be basically like the, the value of G at the horizon will be the, the, the point of where the instability would be stronger, right? So, so because there are negative powers of R in G, and you calculate this at the horizon, basically what you get is the smaller you make the mass, the larger the curvature near the horizon. This is the standard uh, case in GR, right? The more compact you make the black hole, the larger the curvature in the horizon. So the larger the, 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 uh, the modules of, of, of the effective mass, so if you have the right sign, you get an instability for, for, for smaller black holes, right? And for larger black holes, there will be black holes of GR. So, so this is an example where you have black holes that are not the same in theory. If you're below a mass threshold, then, then you get scalarization. If you're above the mass threshold, you just have Schwarzschild. This, similarly, interestingly, so this generalizes to care, right, as well. But the interesting thing when you turn on the, the, the spin is that you can also have a, a different behavior. So for care, G changes sign near the horizon. It's not sign definite, right? So you see there's a min minus signs here. So I mean, if you, if, so if you spin the black hole fast enough, actually, you can change the sign of the gauss bonnet invariant, which means what you can do is if you have a, if phi double prime has the opposite value, then Schwarzschild black holes will be stable in all cases for all, for all masses, right? So you wouldn't be, see any, be able to see any deviation from GR for spherical black holes, but black holes that spin fast enough would suddenly become susceptible to this tachyonic instability and, and grow hair, right? And this is not, I mean, 
This is similar to what I talked about regarding superradiance yesterday, but that's a different instability. This is not superradiance. The, 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 the hair is not generated by superradiance. And moreover, because, because the condition violates the Nover theorem, the, this is permanent hair. I mean, there is a configuration with, with, that is stationary and has hair, basically, and violates the Nover theorem. Okay. So, so this, is a, this is a generalization, effectively, of, of the Damour esposto farese model that now works for black holes as well. Uh, and and uh, it shows you that, in fact, there are broader classes of theories that have this behavior than just the Damour esposto farese model. So it's important. So I focused here on, on the onset of the instability. I told you that, that um, it is this term that creates the instability. The scalar field wants to grow. Of course, this is a linear instability. If you look at only linearized theory, you will see that it keeps growing forever. But the, but the point is, of course, when the scalar grows enough, linear theory is no longer applicable. You go at the, you, you have to include nonlinear corrections to this. And, and if you're, if in the right theory, these corrections will just stop the instability and, and stabilize the configuration, right? Uh, so people, so people have gone, and, and looked at these theories and found stationary solutions, you know, in, in, in their full glory, right, which have hair, and then people have started studying the stability of these solutions. And, it, and one interesting thing is that if you go, if you go back and choose uh, the, so two choices that have been for the coupling constant, sorry, for F, that have been considered first, the, the, the first one is the simplest one, which is phi squared, so some constant times phi squared. The other one was, uh, which was inspired by the linear model becoming, non the linear coupling becoming quadratic. And then, and then there was basically e to the phi squared, which was inspired by the e to the phi coupling that appears in string theory, basically being elevated to, to something that can satisfy this condition, right? Um, so interestingly, so they both, so the onset of the instability in these two models is exactly the same, because when you, when you linearize to look at the instability, e to the phi square becomes phi square plus corrections, right? Uh, but, so, but they behave differently, but the end point of the instability is different black hole solutions. And, and in fact, it was shown in this paper that they have different stability behavior themselves. So if you take the scalarized solution, it, turns, it turned out that the phi square one was radially unstable, so it, it couldn't really have been the end point of the tachyonic instability, right? Whereas the e to the phi square were stable, radially. So it, uh, and, and, and indeed, I mean, this highlights how even though the onset of the instability is universal, is controlled by that coupling with, with G, right? What kind of black holes you're going to get after the instability is much more sensitive to what kind of nonlinear corrections you have and what is your, your theory on nonlinear interactions. And indeed, I mean, it was later shown that, I mean, the, if, if instead of having e to the phi square in the coupling, you have phi square plus phi to the fourth with the right coefficient, you basically get the same thing because it's just the expansion of the exponential. And you read, so the, the higher nonlinear corrections cure the radial stability problem of the scalarized configurations. But also that even, even a standard kind of phi to the four potential term, which adds nonlinearity for the scalar, could, could cure this stability problem for the phi square solutions. So, so, here's, so what I'm showing you here in this plot is basically um, the mass over scalar charge for, for uh, spherical scalarized solution in the phi square model but with a small mass for the scalar and a, and a phi to the four interaction, okay? So these are self-interactions, mass and self-interaction for the scalar. So lambda, I mean, the mass is kept small because if you make the mass very large, it will quench the tachyonic instability. It's a positive contribution to the mass square, right? But so, so let's first focus for the case of lambda is equal to zero, which is this curve. So all of these hats here, means that the charge and the mass, so if I had, if I take phi and um, uh, choose, choose it to be some coupling constant times phi square, 
The, then in geometric units, units, this coupling constant has dimensions of a length squared, right? And, and of course, I have to choose the value of this. But it turns out that if you, you can scale every quantity by that, by, the, by that length, and then do the calculation once for any value of the coupling constant, and this is what I've done here. So Q hat and M hat are scaled by that characteristic length. So you can then just rescale and produce the, 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 the plot for any, for any uh, value of that coupling constant, right? And similarly, lambda is scaled appropriately, right? So this is the lambda equals zero. No, so no, self, no, quad, no quadratic self-interactions. Uh, so what is happening is that dust line is the threshold of the instability. So everything that is left to that, smaller masses, Schwarzschild is unstable, basically. It's susceptible to that instability, and you expect to, to, to grow, that the scalar field will grow. Everything right of this line, Schwarzschild is a stable solution. There is no reason to grow scalar hair. And, and the, 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 this red line is now the existence line of the scalarized solution that you find if you just go and solve uh, the, the Einstein's equations of the static and spherical, generalized Einstein's equations of the static stationary limits, right? So these, these are all points with different masses and, and different scalar charges. And I mean, so even though these solutions exist, these are the solutions that I said before that were found to be radially unstable. And actually, just by staring at this plot, you can, you can convince yourself that they should be <laughs> unstable. And, and the reason is the following. This is effectively ADM mass, right? So it corresponds to the energy of the configuration. So suppose that I start from here, one of the Schwarzschild solutions that, that are in this region, right? And the instability happens, and I'm trying to, 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 to grow hair, right? How can I end up anywhere on this branch that has a higher ADM mass? Where did the energy come from? You would expect that the instability happens, and then, you know, in fact, there is some energy loss at infinity, and I'm ending up with something which is sli has slightly less energy, but just different charge, basically. There must be some trade-off here, right? So, so it is not reasonable that, that t curves that start from here and tilt to the right, actually, are endpoints of the instability for unstable black holes on the left, because they're higher energy configurations than the, than the other ones, right? But then, if you, if you crank up this lambda, you see that the, cur the curves slowly tilt to the left, and eventually, for sufficiently large lambda, til tilt leftwards, right? And, and indeed, if you study these curves and you look at the stability of the, the radial stability of the solutions along these curves, they are radially stable. Because it is reasonable that these are the endpoints of the instability here. I start, say, from, from a, from a uh, black hole of this mass, the instability happens, and I say I end up somewhere here with a slightly smaller ADM mass because I lost some energy, but with a, with, with a, a non-trivial charge. Okay? The tips here become unstable because the curves start turning again to the, to the right, and these are, again, radially unstable if you do a, a radial stability analysis. Right? So, the, the, so the, the lesson kind of to take home here is, of course, scalarization is really a non-linear effect. It, it starts as a linear instability, so you can study its onset as a linear instability if you want, but it is the nonlinearities that will determine the, 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 the nonlinear interactions that will determine the properties of the final configuration, right? And in fact, if you think about it in nature, we will, let's assume that this was true, I mean, in nature, then, then you would not see, then, then you wouldn't really see uh, that, that necessarily that the hionic instability um, unfolding, because you probably just have a star that already has some hair collapsing, you know, or, or, or while it's collapsing, basically growing hair and so on and so forth. It wouldn't be just Schwarzschild becoming unstable. Okay, so oops. because the onset of the instability is linear, right? You can say. Which, which interactions of the scalar and curvature would actually contribute to the onset? Well, it will only be the ones that will contribute to linear perturbation theory around a curved background, right? Which means you can go and just write them down, 
basically. And, and these are all of the terms you could, you could think of that, that lead to second order equations, basically. So it's part of Kordensky or generalized Galileo, as I talked before, that, that contribute to the, to the tachyonic instability at linear level, basically. So if you just were interested to study the onset of the instability and check how does that happen, what, find, find the thresholds for, for different, for, uh, for both stars or black holes, you could just use that action and everything would be there, right? So you see here that this is the phi squared g term that, that I said before. And in, in fact, for black holes, this is the only term that causes the instability at linear level, because of course, black holes in GR are ritzy, ritzy flat, right? I mean, there is a mass term that if you make it too large, then you could quench the instability because it's a positive contribution to the mass, right? The, then, then there is a potential, uh, there is here a non-trivial kinetic coupling that could, that could regulate the threshold, but by its own, it wouldn't cause the instability, right? And, and for, if, if you have a compact star where it is, is non-trivial, then that could be there. And somebody could ask me now, Wait a second, you told us before that, that the Namur Esposito Farese model uh, causes colorization in stars, but it doesn't look like the Namur Esposito Farese model. Well, this term is just a feel redefinition away from the Namur Esposito Farese model. So if you write the Namur Esposito Farese model in the, in the Jordan frame, I saw it with you before in the Einstein frame, if you write in the Jordan frame and you linearize, this is what you get. And in fact, this beta is is that, that same coupling that appeared in the Damour Esposito Farese model, okay? And, and, you know, there are various ambiguities about, you know, field redefinition. So again, you can show that this is the most general action up to field redefinitions that contribute to, 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 to linear order. But, but, but again, it's the nonlinear correction. So you have basically kind of some, this is some minimum model to describe the onset of scalarization. There is, this is linear in the scalar, as you can see. All of the equations are linear in the scalar because you're linearizing the scalar. Also, oh, the action is quadratic in the scalar, which means the equations are linear in the scalar, right? Uh, in, uh, because you're linearizing the scalar around a curved background. This is when you want, want to study the onset. But, but of course, there will be nonlinearity even in that model through back reaction to the metric, right? So, so. Even in this model, you could, in fact, have stable scalarized solutions without adding extra nonlinearity, just by the metric nonlinearity, right? So this R square phi term doesn't do anything in, in, in the, uh, so I've written it here. This term doesn't do anything for the onset of scalarization in black holes, because as I said, it's zero for care, right? Uh, however, because of this nonlinear back reaction that it can have when you take the metric into account, right? It's actually interesting to study this theory as well. So this theory is interesting from, a, from a, um, so, so what I've done here is that instead of having a, a potential for, for the scalar, to cure that radial stability problem that the phi squared G model had and get, get solutions, I'm considering this coupling, which already exists in the minimal model of scalarization, but it just doesn't affect the onset, right? And, and there are various reasons I'm considering. First of all, it's actually, it's an interesting field theory. If you think of this field theory, so the kinetic term is obviously shift symmetric. These terms are not shift symmetric, but in fact, they are the only terms that you can write down that shift symmetry is broken purely by gravity, just by coupling to curvature. So I mean, if you go to flat space, you recover shift symmetry somehow. So, so it, as a field theory, it's an interesting field theory. It's, it's basically just having uh, you know, some sort of soft symmetry breaking just by, just by coupling to gravity, right? Um, secondly, this is a lower order in terms of derivatives curvature interaction of the scalar. So from an effective field theory point of view, if I have this, then there is no reason to not have that as well, right? It would be generated by, by, by corrections. Uh, so, and of course, there could be other terms, right? But 
I'm just focusing on this because I want to understand what it does. And, and here is the same plot that I showed you before for this theory. And, and lo and behold, it does the same thing. So if I, if I send beta to zero, I recover that bad curve that is radially, where the solutions are radially unstable. But then by cranking up uh, beta, uh, positive values, uh, and after some critical value, the terms, the, the, the curves are left pointing. And indeed, if you go and do properly the stability analysis, you find that all of these solutions are stable and hence expected to be the endpoints of scalarization. So, so the non, kind of the nonlinearity via the metric hiding in this term, in the R phi square coupling, is sufficient to, 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 to give you, you know, nice properties for your solutions, right? Without even other interactions for the scalar. Now, that's kind of the first hint that this is a, an interesting term. So what I'm showing here is uh, existence and an existence plot for scalarized neutron stars in the same theory. So I take the same action and I look for neutron star solutions. So obviously here I have to choose an equation of state, right? So, uh, so this is for a specific equation of state and you can redo the plot for different equations of state, right? So, so what you see here is the value of the two couplings, beta and alpha, right? And explored a very big range of couplings deliberately. And, and the, basically, the, the white part of the parameter space is where the GR solution is stable. So the neutron star is a neutron star of GR. There is no tachyonic instability. It's not scalarized, right? So you see no deviation. The gray, the gray area, forget that for a moment the different shades of gray. Anything that is gray is unstable, to the, susceptible to the tachyonic instability. So, that, so, so you can have neutron stars that are solutions to GR, the scalar field will grow, right? The, the, uh, the colored lines, the color parts, is where you find scalarized neutron star solutions at the full nonlinear level, right? So when you're gray and not colored, basically, you're unstable, but no neutron star solution exists. For, you know, and, and so, so obviously this is an issue, right? Obviously, this is for again for a specific equation of state and a specific central density, right? But you can do this for other equations of state and explore different central densities and different so that you get different masses in the mass radius relation. And and a kind of persistent pattern is what you see here that if I make beta positive, I get, I I don't have I quench scalarization in neutron stars even though I have it for black holes, right? Uh, so, again, that beta R term that kind of cured the stability of black holes is now saving me from constraints on the effect coming from the binary pulsar and from neutron stars. And, and this region will not always be that big, right? And, and you know, you, it requires a lot of further investigation to understand it, but it's a general pattern that at least for, I've, I've got very large betas here, at least for, for small betas, this tends to quench scalarization of neutron stars. All right. Now, the, you know, one a very important point about scalarization is that, as I said, scalarization is an instability around a specific value of the scalar that leads to GR solutions, right? So if I'm sitting at phi equals phi zero, whatever that phi zero is for a given theory, then, then I get GR configurations and hence I, the sun will be described by the Schwarzschild solution in the exterior and you know, uh, uh, non-compact stars will be described by the Schwarzschild solution and then depending on my theory, maybe compact stars as well and certain black holes and so on and so forth. So, and of course, this is a, this is a way to evade the known constraints, right? Uh, but the problem is, you could ask yourself, wait a second, I mean, the star or, or that I'm studying or the black hole is not the only object in the universe, right? How did phi end up in that phi zero value? And, and that goes back to cosmological evolution. So if I, if I take, if I go and do cosmology in my theory and start with some initial, initial data in cosmology for phi, will phi be in that value? Will it stay in that value? Do I have to tune it to be close to that value? 
And of course, it turns out that, and that was known already from the early days of the Damura's Posto-Fareza model, that you need a significant amount of tuning, actually, to get phi to go to this value phi zero in the Damura's Posto-Fareza model. So, so in a sense, there was a tension with cosmology, because if you wanted to believe that the universe is generally unscalarized today, and you have this phi, the, 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 the asymptotic value of phi is this phi zero, right? Then, then, then you had to do tuning in cosmology. If you didn't do that, then asymptotically, the phi, for, for any given configuration, phi would go to a different value, and hence, forget the instability, everything would be scalarized because the asymptotic value is not sitting at the right, at the right value, right? And hence, the phi equals phi zero solution is not admissible at all if you have different asymptotics. So, so, so I mean, that tuning is, is, is obviously disturbing. The, the, the question, of course, is always, can I, this is maybe not the complete theory, so can I supplement the theory with other terms that will make me avoid that tuning? This is just the term that causes the, 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 the nice behavior around the black holes, the decoupling to gauss bonnet and other terms actually deal with cosmology. And, and this is what I'm showing you here. So that, that beta r square coupling, in fact, obviously, because it's a lower curvature invariant, it's, it's linear in the curvature, the other one is quadratic, it becomes more important at small curvatures. So what I'm showing you here is, is the evolution of the scalar field or its energy density in, in that model with the phi square r coupling and the phi square g coupling uh, with a positive beta, which is starting with an order, an order one value, I mean a large value initially, but actually, once you go to the, it, it freezes basically um, during radiation uh, domination, right? And then, and then in the late universe, it, it in fact goes to the value that I want, phi equals zero, because this value becomes an attractor. So, so in this, in, 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 so basically, GR cosmology is a late time attractor if you add this beta phi square R coupling. Right? Uh, so th there's yet another property of that lower order uh, term in terms, of, in terms of derivatives. OK? I want to stress that, of course, if you go back, if you go before BBN, eventually the couplings that I'm talking about, the scalarization, the, the coupling to curvature, or any coupling to curvature, will obviously become important. Right? That is, where to have, as I said in the very, very beginning of the talk, if you want to have deviations from general relativity for solar mass black holes or, or, or compact stars, then obviously there are going to be length scales in your theory. I mean, the couplings, the couplings of your theory will have to have length scales of order kilometers, right? And, and, and hence, clearly, when the universe becomes the size of kilometers, all of these terms will become order one. Right? And, and will be important for early universe cosmology. So, so you, could, you would obviously get, you could, uh, uh, in the, so there are people that have pointed out that you could trigger scalarization in the early universe by quantum fluctuations, right, during inflation, and hence you would have to be led to a different uh, uh, state, right, and, and consider a different inflationary scenario and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not sure how dramatic that is, because clearly I, I, I see this as an effective field theory. I, I couldn't ex extrapolate that this is the right theory all the way to, to, to the UV. You would have to have other terms there and embed it in a, in a different model. And also, uh, you don't have to have vanilla inflation in this model, right? So I'm not claiming that any of the models I showed you is kind of some fundamental uh, theory. You obviously need your UV completion and, and, and uh, to, to these models to, to study um, higher energies, the early universe, and, and so on and so forth. So let me then kind of try to summarize that part of the talk and talk about some perspectives. So, so scalarization, I kind of presented it as, as I have GR solutions and they become unstable tachyonically and then and then they grow hair, basically. This hair is kind of stabilized non-linearly, and I deviate for GR, from GR, and that allows me to have 
certain compact objects in the universe that are exactly as described by GR, certain others which are very different from GR with kind of a, 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 a sharp transition between the two. And of course, the interesting thing observationally there is I can look at observations and you know, I can have one set of observations which match GR perfectly, and then if I look at a different type of objects, then I might actually find a deviation there. So it becomes a, a lot more subtle to, to find this deviation. Uh, and it also answers that question that not all black holes have to be the same if, if, if you deviate from general relativity or the standard model. Uh, so, but, but you can also take the, the reverse view of this, which is more akin to, as I said, what cosmologists think when they think about screening. And you can say, scalarization is a form of screening. I, when I'm in high curvatures, right, or high spins or whatever else, I mean, then, then I'm, I'm not in GR, but when I go to lower curvatures, lower spins, kind of more vanilla objects, then, then scalarization is a mechanism that pushes the scalar down to the constant value, basically, and screens all of the new physics. So I just see GR, basically, in the standard model, right? Which is kind of another interesting perspective to view this. So overall, you can think of scalarization as a linear instability in the strong field regime that is then quenched by the nonlinear terms. And this is helpful to study the onset, but it's fundamentally a nonlinear effect, right? This is just a, just a, just a way of, of understanding things. Everything depends for the fi standard, final configurations of the nonlinear interactions. I talked about scalars, but people have tried to generalize this to vectors, uh, tensors, spinners, and so on and so forth, and, and uh, see if they can have spontaneous generation of these fields. It's significantly I mean, there's quite a bit of work on vectors, but it's significantly harder to do this for vectors, right, without getting ghosts and, you know, uh, uh, ill-defined Ill theories. Uh, people have thought about also changing the tachyonic instability to some other linear instability. You could have a gradient or a ghost-like instability at the linear level that are sequenced by nonlinear effects, right? So this is an interesting kind of uh, direction of investigation currently. Uh, and another, another topic is dynamical scalarization. So here I talked about a single object at a stationary state. And, and scalarization happens or doesn't happen depending on its properties. So I'm going along the properties of the object, say the mass or the spin, and, 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 I, and, and I get unscalarized or scalarized solutions. But but it's interesting to think, could I start with two objects and make a binary out of them? And as the binary evolves, in fact, because of the changes of the property of the binary, the binary is becoming more compact, the, it's spinning faster, and so on and so forth, then the configuration of the scalar field could change. So I could start with unscalarized and scalarize the binary, or, or I could start with a scalarized, a scalarized objects in the binary, and then as the binary evolves or, or the merger happens, then I lose the charge or whatever, right? And I mean, this is obviously something people are, are looking into. Um, and, and in fact, there's also kind of, people are also trying to create uh, parametrizations to, to parametrize the effect kind of in a theory agnostic model in, in the in spiral to, to probe it directly with, with gravitational waves. I've talked about the cosmological evolution and of course, uh, there's a lot more work to be, to be done there. Uh, one thing I'm going to talk about in more detail later about these theories, but I'm, so I'm just going to mention it now, is that, of course, this is a nonlinear effect. So to fully understand it, you really need to do numerics. And to do numerics, you need a well-posed initial value formulation so that you can put this in a computer. And this is a major issue for all of these theories. So I will discuss this at the, at tomorrow, probably. Now. And of course, there is a lot of discussion about the stability of scalarized black holes and the properties of scalarized black holes. I mean, for me, scalarized, the, 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 the actions I showed you is, are not the scalarization theory, right? Because scalarization is not a theory, it's like a mechanism that wants to become a theory. And of course, you can add different non types of nonlinearities and so on and so forth and embed it 
in an interesting model. So it's like inflation in a sense, right? You found a mechanism that does something interesting for you, like, like the same way in, in, inflation provides accelerated expansion in the early universe and solves a bunch of problems, basically. Here, scalarization screens uh, um, or creates non-GR uh, non solutions where you, where you might like them, right? But of course, it's a, it's a mechanism in many theories, and it's about finding the right theory. Okay, and there's also a review about all of this that you can read about. Okay, any questions? Because I'm going to switch topic now to Lorentz symmetry breaking. Okay. So I'm now going to leave the, what I called yesterday the under the lamppost approach. But I just wanted to, to, to find interesting theories with one scalar field that could uh, show deviations from GR and see how large these deviations could be and then, you know, uh, explore some interesting questions, right? And, and go to, to kind of one example of the, the, the more principled approach. Can we drop one of the fundamental principles of general relativity and, and, uh, and then construct some effective field theory that encodes that and then compare that with the data? And, and in which case we, we think we can interpret the constraints as constraints on the violation of that fundamental principle, right? And I've chosen, I mean, uh, there, as I gave you some examples yesterday, Lawrence, symmetry breaking, parity violations, you know, whether the gravitational has a mass, and you could come up with more, more if you want to. Um, but among them, I chose Lawrence symmetry breaking for uh, uh, two reasons, really. First, it is, I've worked on Lorentz symmetry break, so I actually know something about it. Uh, and second, secondly, secondly, it is a very drastic departure when it comes to black holes. I mean, to give up Lorentz symmetry, you start wondering yourself if, if black holes even exist, right? If you give up Lorentz symmetry. So, so it's interesting in that context. And so I'm gonna start with that. So obviously what I have here is the causal structure of special relativity, which we also saw in general relativity locally. Right, future light cone, past line cone, and so on and so forth. Right, and and if you, so you can think of violating Lorentz symmetry in in different ways. So one way is to say you know there is some preferred observer in the universe who is in a better position than the others, and I need to do physics with respect to this observer. Right, but even when you go to the coordinate system of that observer you could still have linear dispersion relations for your perturbations, right? So if you have linear dispersion relations, this, this observer will still see this type of causal structure. There, because the, the dispersion relation is linear, there is a maximum speed of propagation, basically, for, for all, all momenta, right? So, and of course, you, what you could have is in this case, and what you do generically have, is different coefficients here for different fields, Right? Because the, the fact that this is one for all massless, ma I mean, that this is C for all massless fields, basically, would be, is a consequence of, general, of special relativity. So if you have linear dispersion relations, but no relativity, basically, then you just have different coefficients there. So you have different modes propagating at different speeds, but they all have a constant speed, so they all have light cones. They're just different light cones. So you could think of, you know, the widest one, <laughs> as the light cone, and the causal structure wouldn't be that much different, in fact, right? Which is an interesting uh, thing in its own right. But, but of course, you can, you can already think about what would happen in that case to black holes, if you remember the kind of the standard picture in GR textbooks of how we understand uh, black holes in, in, in Eddington Finkenstein coordinates. So we think of the light cones and we say, oh, actually, as if I go at ingoing Eddington Finkenstein coordinates, the light cones tilt, right? And then at the horizon, they've tilted enough that the outgoing null ray can't escape to infinity, basically, <laughs> and that demarcates the interior of the, of the black hole. That's kind of the standard picture. So you can make the same picture for what I just said, if you have different excitations with different light cones, the, the one with the largest light cone 
you can consider it, try to construct that diagram and say, okay, if that light cone tilts enough, then I should still have black holes in that theory because that, that picture doesn't really change qualitatively. But if you take another one, if you take another excitation, like a slightly narrower light cone, then it will have to tilt a bit less to be trapped, so it will have another horizon a bit further out there, and then maybe another one there if you have a, an even slower mode. So actually, intuitively, in the scenario that I just said, do you have a question? I'm oh, sorry. In the scenario that I just said, what, what you expect very intuitively is that kind of black holes will still exist with kind of a structure of nested horizons where the, the slower mode will, will be trapped earlier, basically. And, and the faster mode will be able to penetrate a bit, a bit um, further, but there still be a horizon for it. I mean, this is just intuition without even looking at the theory. But then you can violate, of course, Lorentz symmetry more drastically by having nonlinear dispersion relations for, for, linear, uh, for linear excitations, right? Which is something we see constantly in condensed matter and other fields, I mean, in non-relativistic field theories, right? And, and so, so you could have the standard linear. So here you could have different coefficients for different modes, but then you could also have higher corrections to the dispersion relation, which means that if I crank up the speed enough, sorry, if I crank up the momentum enough, right, then I can get any speed for my, for my mode, right? And so, and there is no maximum speed for my excitation. So this is, and this is what we usually understand fundamentally as non-relativistic physics, right? There are really no light cones. In fact, this dispersion relation always make, only makes sense as it is in a given foliation of space-time, right? You have to choose a time coordinate. You can reparameterize that time coordinate, but, but only in that coordinate does it look like this, because if I, mix, if I try to mix time and space, then I will distort the dispersion relation and I create higher omega terms, right? So, which could mean higher time derivatives, which would mean different, more degrees of freedom and a host of other things. So the logic, the logic of, of, of theories that have this dispersion relation is that there is actually a preferred foliation, which I should be doing physics, in which I do have you know, nice second time derivatives, but I have potentially higher spatial derivatives, right? The standard tenant, sorry. I mean, it depends on, uh, are you talking about matter? Yeah, no, yeah. So I, must, I, I mean, if, if, you, if you were to ask matter to have this kind of dispersion relation, like electrons or photons, I mean, there is some, there is some debate about this, but you would basically have Planckian or trans-Planckian constraints. There would be extremely tight constraints here, right? Uh, but, I, but, but we're talking about gravity, not matter here, okay? So, so, that, so, this, so, the motivation here is exactly this, perhaps I should have said this clearly, that indeed, I mean, Lorentz symmetry is extremely well tested in, in, in matter. We believe it's a symmetry of the standard model, but, but in fact, it's not the symmetry of general relativity. So special relativity is a symmetry when I, when I, when I go to flat space, I get it for free, basically, right? And it's, it's a local symmetry of, 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 uh, uh, of, of general relativity, but in fact, you can break Lorentz symmetry all the time in gravity. I mean, this room doesn't respect Lorentz symmetry because there are preferred directions in the room, right? So any, any non-trivial configuration, basically. So, so Lorentz symmetry in gravity is a statement. When I say have a gravity theory, in the, the question of is it a Lorentz invariant theory or not is really a question of is Minkowski space an admissible, so is Minkowski space with zero all of the other fields that might be part of my gravitational sector and admissible solution. I could classically, I could perfectly well have matter coupled to a metric, and then I can have, I'll, I'll, I'll show examples later, obviously, but I can have matter coupled to the metric, and then I have a gravitational action with a metric and a bunch of other fields. Minkowski space is a solution with some non-trivial configuration of the other fields. Right? which is indeed what would define a preferred observer or a preferred foliation. Otherwise, why, how are they preferred? Right? And, but the standard model only couples to the metric, 
So the standard model still respects Lorentz symmetry because it doesn't see the other fields, right? So the question becomes then about quantum corrections, but I'll talk about this in, in a bit more detail later, okay? Okay, but we're still at the heuristics level, I'll show, I'll show theories later. So, so if you were to just think, oh, wait a second, if I had the theory like that, right, there has to be some preferred foliation. So its causal structure has to look a little bit like this, right? I mean, it's a preferred foliation that must be surfaces of simultaneity, which is exactly what I don't have in GR, right? There are no space-like regions anymore. I, if I have an event, then it lies in some constant preferred time surface, which is what I need to write down a dispersion like this, right? And everything in the north is in the future, and everything in the, in the south is in the past. The causal structure is super simple. There are no light cones, there is nothing, right? And, and of course, it doesn't seem like a black hole could fit into that picture, basically. I mean, how do I define black holes in the conventional sense? Okay, so let's now, so let's now come back to what we're discussing. Let's look at some theories, okay? So this is the actual Einstein ether theory. So standard Einstein Hilbert term that would give you Einstein's equations, right? And then you have a vector field. The vector field is, uh, so, so I impose that this vector field is time-like. I'm using uh, a plus minus 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 signature here. So this is a time-like vector field, right? I'm posing this by, by hand. I mean, I can add the Lagrange multiplier here. Or, or, so there are two ways to impose this. Either you add the Lagrange multiplier in the, in the action or, or you restrict the variations so that they respect this condition, right? So, so by, why am I imposing this? Because I want there to be a preferred observer. And a preferred observer, what is a preferred observer, is basically a threading of my space-time by some special time-like trajectories, right? So this would be the trajectories of this field. Or you can think of this as the four velocity of that, of that observer, right? So if I want a preferred observer, this would be the way to describe it in a covariant manner. Right? And then I say, okay, let me go and write down. So uh, let me add this constraint. So I put the, the, the vector field to be always time-like to play the role of a preferred observer. And then I create an action which is quadratic in derivatives. And I write down all of the terms that, that uh, I'm allowed to write, right? Which are these. So there are four independent coupling constants that parameterize the whole spa the parameter space, right? So this is the most general kind of effective field theory that you could think about for general relativity plus a time-like vector, right? So this is a Lorentz breaking theory for the reason I just said before. If you derive the equations, you will see that you, if you go to flat space, it's an admissible solution, then that field becomes trivial. It points, becomes one, zero, 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 basically, right? And, and, and it points in a time-like direction, and this is what breaks Lorentz symmetry in gravity. Clearly, the, met the, 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 the metric would still be invariant under Lorentz transformations, but, but that field is not, and it picks for you the preferred direction. And this is the threading by the trajectories of the preferred observer, basically, in the space-time. So this was put together precisely to, to provide quantitative constraints on how much of a preferred observer could we afford to have, given our observations, right? So you can go and compare, get predictions from this theory, and then look at gravitational experiments and say, okay, how much are these C1, C2, C3, C4? Okay, how much can I afford to have? Now, if you, if you start, then you could ask yourself, okay, what happened? So generally, obviously, this vector field is not orthogonal to any hypersurfaces or anything like that, right? Uh, what if I were to assume, before I even do variations, that this vector field is hypersurface orthogonal? Then locally, I could always express it in terms of some scalar. So hypersurface orthogonal vectors, locally, it means that there's a scalar times the gradient of another scalar, basically. But of course, it's normalized to one, so that fixes it completely in terms of that scalar t, right? And I could, I could stick that in the action now, 
and I can get an action before because I want to do that before the variation, right? I'm not looking for solutions where the, the vector is hypersurface orthogonal. I want to fix that at the level of the theory, reduce the field content. So I'm imposing this before the variation. Uh, and, and, and then I can write down the theory in terms of T, which I haven't done here. But then I can also say, wait a second, I mean, I could actually choose T, T is a scalar field, I could choose it as a time coordinate. Because its gradient is always time-like, because I had the time-like, the unit constraint on U, right? So if, if, if its gradient is time-like, right, then it's a good time coordinate. So let me, let me choose it as a time coordinate, and then by, by sacrificing some of, the, some of the coordinate invariants that I have, right? And, and then U will take this form, where N is, is known as the lapse function, right? And the action of Einstein ether theory would become this, where I've redefined the couplings in this way. So what, are, what do I have here? So this is now the, th the three-dimensional Ricci. So I'm looking at the three-dimensional slices of this foliation. This is the Ricci. This is the extrinsic curvature. Kij is the extrinsic curvature, so it contains the time derivative of the three metric, the, th the metric that the induced metric on the slices, right? Uh, N is the lap function, which is basically a measure of distance between the slices, right? So Kij contains the, 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 the time derivative of the metric, the laps and the shift. The shift tells me how I move from one slice to the other and how I relate the points, right? And, and this AI here is just written here. It's the spatial derivative of the logarithm of the laps, right? So that's how, what my previous theory becomes when I make this assumption and I choose a specific foliation, right? And why did I tell you all of this? Because this is part of another theory. So what I had in the previous slide is basically this L2 part of this much bigger theory. So this is, this is known as, as Horava gravity, where L2 is supplemented by two more families of terms, L4 and L6. I'm not going to write this down. There are about 60 different terms in total, right? So, but these are basically the sets of all operators that contain, in the case of L4, all terms that contain up to four spatial derivatives in the preferred foliation. And here, all terms up to six spatial derivatives in the preferred foliation, okay? So time derivatives are in here and there are only two, right? Then two spatial derivatives are here. Then here are four spatial derivatives, six spatial derivatives. So this is a theory that would have higher order dispersion relations. It is a theory with a preferred foliation. This T is a preferred foliation. And it's written in that native foliation. I've chosen T as my time coordinate, right? Now the, sim the, the theory is not invariant under diffeomorphisms which would be the case of general relativity. I've lost covariance, basically, right in the preferred foliation. But I have the residual gauge freedom. So I can still do three-dimensional diffeomorphisms. I haven't introduced any coordinates or anything in the three slices. And I can still do time reparameterizations. So I can, and indeed, if you, if you look at where I started, right, if I take t and I take it to another function of t, ua is invariant. So, so time reparameterizations are, are, should be a symmetry of this theory. Okay. Now, so let's recap. I started with a theory with a, a metric and an ether that, because which was normalized to one, so it was providing a preferred threading and it was a, a, a good EFT for a, a, um, a, um, a preferred observer. It only has two time derivatives, and it's covariant, right? So, so I'm going to have uh, linear dispersion relations, but I still have the preferred observer, right? Uh, I don't know how to UV complete this theory. I'm treating it as an effective field theory, right? Uh, so I'm not claiming that it has any better properties in the UV than, than general relativity, but it's just a good description of the preferred observer relativistically. And then, I, from that, I actually, which is not the way it came about originally, but from that, I got to another theory, which is Hosava gravity, 
which has a different field content, a metric and a scalar field, in fact, in its covariant version, right? But, but it has nonlinear dispersion relations, once I supplement it with the higher order terms. And the interesting thing about this theory is that it is actually one of the few gravity theories that we have that has a known UV completion. So the reason uh, I have there the L4 and the L6 terms is that it has been shown that this action is power counting and normalizable, right? So it has a hope of being a quantum gravity theory. I'm not, you know, there is, it's questionable whether it is compatible with observations and so on and so forth as, as, as a quantum gravity theory, right? But, uh, you know, let's leave this to one side. We don't have time to discuss it. And, and uh, this, this is not going to interest me in, in, in this talk, right? Even if it isn't, having a, a, a normalizable quantum gravity, the a normalizable gravity theory for which you can write the action down simply is, is no mean feat. I mean, it's interesting theoretically, no matter how you cut it. But so what do you, so, so the, the reason, I'm, I'm also not going to go into the details of why this is, why this is, uh, uh, renormalizable, power counting renormalizable, but what is, I can, I can tell you that what is happening is that because, because you're adding the higher order dispersions, it obviously changes the behavior of the propagator in, in, in the UV, and it is that that regularizes all of the Feynman diagrams, right? Uh, so you're, you can think of giving up Lorentz symmetry in exchange of getting a, U, a UV completion here, okay? I'm not going to talk about the L4 and the L6 terms. I'm not going to talk about the UV completion. I'm not interested in the UV completion. If you take the reason I show you this correspondence between the theories is that if I take just the L2 part of this action, right, which is, so this operator is suppressed by some mass scale, which I've called M star. This is supposed to be a large mass scale, 10 to the, five, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 GV, right? Because you only, you, you only care about this coming into the UV to, to, to render the theory UV complete, right? So I don't, I, I'm not interested in this for, for now. I can think of this as the low energy limit of Hosawa gravity. And in fact, I can even forget about all of this. And I don't even have to think of this as Hosawa gravity. I can say here is a theory with a preferred foliation at the low energy limit, which in fact, if I go backwards a step and I write it in terms of in terms of T, right? So I just plug this relation in the Einstein ether action before the variation, I can write in a covariant way. So it's a theory with a scalar field and a metric that has a preferred foliation. And it's fully covariant, I mean, at least at the low energy, and I can do physics. And I can actually answer the question, are there any black holes in this theory, right? So that's what I want to focus on. Power counting and normalizing. Yeah. So, so I'll take now these two theories. Sorry, one more point before I go any further, which is to address more, more concretely the question. So I'm assuming here that I take these actions and I couple them minimally to matter, in the sense that I couple only the metric and not the ether or the T field to matter. This, if that were the case, then constraints, the, the, the standard model wouldn't see any Lorentz violations at three level, at least, I mean, classically. So, so, so I wouldn't have to worry about this. Then you have to worry about quantum corrections. And you could ask me the question, wait a second, I mean, if I look at quantum corrections, won't U and T couple to the standard model? And hence, that will introduce uh, changes in the standard model potential Lorentz violations, and then I should be able to pick this up. And this is, this is a big debate about how this works. So the, the, the short answer is, we're not sure. Uh, that's a hard calculation to do. The expectation, the naive expectation is that yes, you have to have a universal scale. But actually, the more, the more elaborate expectation is that it depends on, on the quantum aspects of your gravity theory. So for instance, if you go here and you look at, at this, which is supposed to be UV complete, you will realize that there are two scales in the theory. The scale 
in which quantum corrections kind of will become important, the M star scale and the, the Planck scale hiding in here, right? And if you actually go and do calculations for radiative corrections with gravity loops in, in matter and so on and so forth, you will see that they contain this scale and that scale. And if these two scales are not the same, you get parametric suppression, right? So if that scale is significantly lower than the Planck scale, then you get suppression of all of these corrections in gravity. And, 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 and in fact, then if you look at gravity only, the, nat the technically natural hierarchy of the scale is that this is smaller than, than that. Right? Otherwise, the, the one would correct the other and bring it to the, to the, to the higher value. So, so, so there are, in fact, you can have two sectors that have different symmetries if they're weakly coupled, right? And if the coupling is dimensionless, which is exactly what happens in gravity. You have a dimensionless coupling and the gravity is very weakly coupled. I mean, it's, a very, it's the weakest force in nature. So, 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 so it is not obvious how the, that percolation will happen. It's also not obvious that it won't happen, right? Uh, so, but then it becomes debatable, should I be calculating quantum corrections in a putative quantum gravity model, or I'll just say, okay, let me just constrain Lorentz symmetry in gravity and see if I can do that directly, which is what we're interested in here, okay? So, now that I've showed you these two theories, I'll focus on these two theories. As, uh, and, and, uh, and as I said, kind of the low energy limit of, of, of Hosawa gravity in, in its covariant form. Yep. Yeah. To get the effective system. So I think that is not a problem, but allowing higher. No, no, but I mean, it, in the context of effective field theory, it is not a problem to say I have my, my, my gravity, which is described by this and is low and violating, and, and I couple matter there. But what I'm saying is, if you really want to claim that this is a UV completion, that you, then, like you do in Horava, then, then you should argue why in the UV, I have a Lorentz, invi Lorentz violating UV completion of gravity and a Lorentz invariant standard model. How, how am I keeping the Lorentz violations in one sector and they're not percolating the other one by quantum corrections? And so what I tried to say before is the conventional wisdom is that they will percolate, right? But, but, the, but actually the cut here is that the, the, you know, the percolation is happening through the coupling constant. This is a dimensional full coupling constant, this weak coupling, so high, so, and there are multiple scales, so it's not that obvious a question. And, and also, there are a lot of other ways, other, I mean, there are other ways in which you could suppress per the percolation. So, for instance, if there is supersymmetry, right, then you don't need Lorentz symmetry for supersymmetry. And, and hence, and hence uh, supersymmetry actually just naturally prevents lower order uh, Lorentz breaking operators. Or, or if, the, if there is, there is a non-perturbative fixed point in gravity, then you can have strong dynamics in the UV. And uh, I mean, that people are, you know, this is an active kind of uh, topic of, uh, of research. So, but it's not, it's not clear, right? But where the effective field has been found is the uh, higher coupling, right? So this part I don't understand. Yeah. So, so equipped now with these two theories, I can actually go and answer the question of what happens to black holes, because I can calculate black hole solutions. And I can do that in the simplest setup. I just take spherical symmetry and I say, okay, can I find black hole, spherically symmetric static black holes in these theories? And if you do this for Einstein ether theory, you get exactly what I hinted to intuitively. So, so what you get here is that you have, so the theory has has metric perturbations, the conventional metric perturbations, and then there are vector modes in the ether, and there is also one scalar mode in the ether, right? Because that's not a gauge field, the ether. And, and they all travel at different speeds. I've denoted them here as SIs. And if you, and if you go and do pet linear perturbation theory on a non-trivial background, call it GM, then you see that the perturbations appear to be propagating along the null cones <coughs> of some effective metric, which is a combination of G mu nu 
and, and, and the ether, and this is the speed of the corresponding mode, right? So they all propagate along different metrics, the null cones of different metrics, but they all have linear dispersion relations, so they all have null cones, basically. And it's exactly that nested structure of, of null cones that I, that I discussed before. And when you try to go and find black hole solutions, you, you, what you uncover is indeed that there are multiple nested horizons. The fastest mode has the innermost horizon, the slowest the outermost, right? And, and in fact, there are killing horizons of the corresponding metric, right? So, so it all falls nicely together. It's that intuitive picture that I, that I drew before. But that's much more complicated in the case of, of you know, the modified dispersion relations. And one thing actually, one more kind of puzzle here that you could think about is that there is something fishy with the fact that I have the modified dispersion relation. When I say, if I go to Hozawa gravity that I showed before, and I take the L4 and the L6 terms, then I'll have the higher order corrections to the dispersion relation, right? <laughs> then if I neglect them, I will end up with linear dispersion relations. So somehow light cones will appear as an artifact of the low energy limit, right? And that, that doesn't sound right because that would mean that, say, take this very simple the correction to the dispersion relation, right? You're trying to take this A towards zero. You make A smaller and smaller and smaller. You can make A arbitrarily small. Then the causal structure will be like this, right? It doesn't matter how small a is sufficiently large k would propagate at inf you know arbitrarily high speeds basically right make a exactly zero you get light cone so this means as if there is a discontinuity in the causal structure when I go from a arbitrarily small to a zero right so and, and that that sounds weird in fact this is not what happens so if you take l4 and l6 to zero and you go to the low energy limit and covariantize it, there is memory of the preferred foliation of this causal structure in the theory, which is very interesting and striking in my view. So, and I'll show you how this comes about if my computer wakes up, yeah. So take this ANSADS, which is in fact the most general spherically symmetric metric in the preferred foliation, right? Uh, it has non-diagonal terms because I've used some of my gate symmetry to make t my time. So I'm not, it's not like Schwarzschild coordinates, right? Uh, and, and, but as, as in the general spherically symmetric case, there are these two functions, uh, s and n of, of radius that are uh, unknown, right? And then look at what happens to the equation for t in the covariant version of, of the low energy limit of Horava gravity, right? And, and you see that it actually takes this form. So there is a radial derivative, and I have, and I have this condition, right? So this is basically some equation that I need to solve at any time interval, right? And to solve it, I need boundary conditions. I need to know what happens at infinity, and I need to know what happens at the center of my configuration, assuming that the whole configuration is, is nice and, and, and radial, right? And in fact, I could integrate it once, and I get something like this. So that's kind of an a set of integration constants, one for every time, one for every leaf of that preferred foliation, right? But there is R square here. so. Either it diverges at the center, which means I need to fix this to avoid this divergence at the center if the configuration is regular everywhere, right? Like a star, right? Or it diverges where the lapse goes to zero in the preferred foliation. And that again, would, I would have to fix this to, to, to undo that divergence, right? Now, that equation is basically an equation for an instantaneous mode. So if you look at, if you, look at, if you try to do like a three plus one decomposition here, and you think of this as an initial value problem, right? This would be an elliptic equation you have to solve. It's just in the, it's here, I'm just doing it in the reduced uh, case, right? The, this would be an elliptic equation you have to solve 
which is not a constraint equation, like the usual constraints you have in CR. You have to, to, to evolve in time, you would have to solve it on every slice to give you the missing initial data, the, the missing data, initial data. And for this, you need to impose boundary data, right? Infinitely far away on your slices, at the end, at the end of your slices, right? So, so basically, you get information from infinity by solving that equation instantaneously at every, at every point, right? Which means the theory makes sense as an initial value problem only in that preferred foliation, right? The, and the causality is still the causality of the preferred foliation because I need information everywhere. In the, so to, to, to set up any problem, I need information everywhere on one slice, basically, to, to, to move on, right? So, so it is remarkable that the low energy theory actually has memory. Of, of, of that causal structure, and you still have the preferred foliation here encoded in this way, right? And you, and the, 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 so the light cones of the light cones of the modes. At, you know, when I forget the L four and the L six terms, will appear, but but they're not really physically relevant because they're still the instantaneous mode that has infinite propagation. So that leaves us again to, are there any black holes, basically? Because I'll have, I have the, the, I'll have this, so if I solve it, I still find the structure. Of, so if I, if I go and look for a state static, st uh, spherically symmetric solution in this theory, for the, so this theory has a metric and the scalar field. And if I look at the metric and the scalar perturbation, or or matter perturbations couple minimally to the metrics, the standard light, light basically, I will find again this structure of nested horizons because, because as I said, the linearized limit, there are these linear dispersion relations. Uh, sorry, at the low energy limit, there are these linear dispersion relations, right? But I know that if I add any corrections to, the, to, 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 the, to go towards the UV completion, then I can cross with high enough momenta this, this horizons, so they're not really relevant. So is that really a black hole? Or can I just take higher momenta and, 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 and reach the singularity, right? And, and, that, and that's the most remarkable thing, that in fact I can do that because there is what, what we call a universal horizon that blocks everything irrespective of how fast it propagates in these configurations. And I'll show it to you in, in pictorial form here. So if you solve the equations exactly, right, you can ask yourself, OK, t equal constant surfaces are surfaces of this preferred foliation. I can go to this preferred foliation, or I can go to another foliation, and, and I see an, another coordinate system, and then I see how, how these uh, slices behave. And, and this is what I've done here. Right? So this is like conventional, this is radius, right? This is, this is time in, in conventional radius and time in spherical symmetry. And the, the, the colored lines are leaves of the preferred foliation. Okay? So remember that causality here is really simple for, so, so if I think of having something that has a modified dispersion relation in this space time, right? And hence, if I crank up the momentum, I can travel basically arbitrarily fast. The only kind of causal condition is that I can go in the past. This is an ordered foliation. So one leaf is strictly after the other because it has a higher value of t, and I'm moving towards the future. This is the only causal requirement. Right? So what I've done here is that I've color-coded the lines of the preferred foliation in a way that, that darker color means later in time, larger value, basically, of the, of the preferred time parameter. Right? The dust line is the killing horizon for photons in this, in this space time. Right? So this is what we would perceive as the black hole in the, you know, if we ignore the, the arbitrarily fast propagation. Right? And what you see is that the leaves of the foliation now cross, but then they pile up at a different ra constant radius surface. Right? And in fact, this red line is, is that surface that they pile up, which is in itself a leaf of the foliation. Right? And then when you start going in, they start bending in the other direction, and then there is another one and another. And how many of these will depend on, the, on which solution you choose? But, but don't worry about what happens there. Right? 
This is the interior, in a sense. So focus on that part. And imagine that, so if I, if I have a, if I'm here at that event, and I emit a signal with some perturbation, and assume that this is a non-relativistic signal, so I crank up the momentum and it travels arbitrarily fast, the only condition is it will, after a while, I should find it at a point which is contained in some darker green, green surface. So indeed, I will find it somewhere in the future, right? And, and these surfaces span, the darker, span all of the exterior of that red line, right? So, so out here, everything looks normal. I, I, I basically, with, I can access the whole exterior of the red line. I can also go in the interior because there are darker surfaces in the interior. But if, say, say I'm, I'm here, start from that point here, that event there, and I emit something, and it can travel arbitrarily fast, darker surfaces only exist further in the interior, right? Because, exactly because that is a leaf of the foliation itself, and I can travel in the past. So, so that is what we call the universal horizon. Basically, the foliation closes on itself to demarcate a region where everything in the interior of that region is, is in the future of everything in the exterior by that very simple uh, kind of causal criterion that, I mean, the foliation defines the past and the future in the conventional sense of your clock, right? And, and hence, that part, nothing can escape to the exterior, right? And this, you can show that it is inside any other, and any, any would-be low energy limit horizon, killing horizon, and so on and so forth, and it traps, it traps any mode irrespective of how fast it propagates. So that's kind of a new notion of a black hole. For, this, for, for these theories, which is non-relativistic, so it's entirely remarkable to me, at least, that it exists, right? And, and it exists only in curved space, right? Um, and, and, and it was very striking. I mean, so this is based on a full, full, solving the equations fully. Uh, similar results have been obtained by just solving the T equation on a Schwarzschild background, and then you can draw these leaves on the causal diagram of, of, of Schwarzschild, and you see exactly the same behavior. They cross the standard horizon, and they pile up on some surface. So that would be the, 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 the universal horizon, and that would be the, the black hole interior, even for, even for the uh, arbitrarily fastly propagating modes. OK? How much time do I have? Okay, I think I'm going to stop. Is, is, uh, it's now that we have to stop, right? It's 11, right? Yeah. So I think I'm going to stop here for today. And tomorrow I'm going to continue with, with Lawrence violations. And then I'm going to try to talk about observations in the second half. <laughs>